Good afternoon. In this video, I want to uh, link you to uh, a couple of videos that uh, discuss the issue of the eternal sonship versus the incarnational sonship. Uh, one is by an hour long, it's by Victor Tay, and he does a very good job of laying out the uh, arguments for and against the eternal sonship and incarnational. He's an inc incarnational sonship guy. But he lays out the arguments and he deals with a lot of the scriptures. It's a very good uh, video on it. Uh, and it's about an hour long, but if you have any really serious questions about you know, certain verses, uh, he goes over them, and I'll link you to that. Also, uh, uh, I'll link you to uh, uh, Pastor Lawson. He's got one in Christology, number one. It's called the Heresy. He goes, Heresy of Eternal Generation. And uh, he starts speaking about that about 19 minutes in. So, uh, and he explains why it's a heresy, the idea of eternal generation. Uh, in this video, I'm going to look at uh, a question that I received uh, by a subscriber. And uh, I'll try to answer that. He says, here, some of the problems of inc incarnational sonship of Christ is that, they, is that this teaching confuses or destroys the internal relationship that exists within the Trinity. Because if the Son is not eternally begotten by the Father, then neither did the Spirit eternally proceed from the Father through the Son. Well, that, so that's what makes it, that's what makes the eternal sonship the wrong issue. Because the issue of the three persons is that they're co-eternal. And if you've got one eternally begotten, he's not, he's not co-eternal. He's coming logically after the Father. And then the Holy Spirit is coming logically after the, the uh, other two. So the problem really comes with the, the uh, sovereignty of the uh, eternal sonship guys uh, and their issue. And the fact is is that all three persons, before the, the plan was con conceived, were three persons, and they were co-equal, co-eternal. Sonship, and that's what these guys don't want to recognize, sonship is an issue of subordination. That's why he was the son. In order to support himself, subordinate himself to the Father. And of course the Holy Spirit subordinates himself even further by proceeding from the two of them. And that's why the way the system of the plan is set up is that you know the uh, uh, you, you, pray, you pray to the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a, there's a hierarchical structure going on there. Uh... Also, if there's no son prior to the incarnation, then there was no father either. Uh, and yet, throughout the Old Testament, we see God being referred to as the father of Israel. Well, you can be a father of other things besides being the father of the son. The father just means the creator. And, of course, Jesus Christ is the everlasting father of Israel. So you don't have to have a, um, uh, a father-son issue going on within the Trinity to have... Uh, uh, God the Father, a Father, God, God fathering a life, creating things, and he would be regarded by his creation as their father. Like Jesus Christ is considered the father of Israel, as the everlasting father. Uh, instead of having a triune God eternally existing in three distinct persons with three distinct names, now, there's always three distinct persons. Just because we don't know the names doesn't mean that they're not the three distinct persons. See, they're, they're, they're conflating the idea of, well, if we don't know their names, then there, there's not really three distinct persons. No, we just don't know, know names. Until they gave themselves names and as part of the plan. Uh, for our sake. Uh, let's see. Father, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, those who hold to this doctrine of the incarnational sonship end up with a nameless trinity prior to the incarnation. So what? Why do they have to have names? Well, all we know is that there were three persons who existed, co-equal and co-eternal. We know them now, part, because of the plan, they revealed themselves to us as part of the plan as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They won't even, they won't even reveal that, that, that way in the, in the Old Testament. This is really a New Testament revelation. So the fact of the matter is, is that there's nothing in the Old Testament, the idea that, well, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all we know about the, the Trinity in the Old Testament is that there were three persons. And then, basically, we go back and we look at, we can look back on from the New Testament revelation and see differences. You know, the Father and then the, the angel of the Lord operating, 
and the Holy Spirit operating. But they didn't make an issue of making themselves known uh, as three persons back in the uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and we'd be forced to say that God has chosen not to reveal himself as he truly is, but only as he has become. We, we, we say it's progressive revelation. God didn't reveal, reveal the, 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 the triune relationship until the New Testament. And we look back on the Old Testament and on, with understanding now of looking at it, saying, okay, yes, we can see the Father, we can see the Holy Ghost there, we can see the, the, uh, uh, we can see the, uh, uh, the second person in the Trinity uh, operating as the angel of the Lord. So we understand the triune nature because of the New Testament. And that's revealed, that's progressive re revelation. In other words, instead of actually revealing who he is, the triune God instead chose to reveal, uh, reveal himself by the titles he would assume all the roles he would take on and not who he really is. What's well, progressive revelation? And the more, in the Old New Testament, he revealed himself more and more until we finally understood the idea of the Father, Son, and the uh, uh, Holy Ghost relationship because that came, at, the son, sonship issue came after the Incarnation. Uh, this is dangerous close to modalism. No, it isn't. It doesn't do modalism. It's three persons. Three persons. Now, in the Old Testament, they weren't concerned about the idea of being three persons. They were getting glimpses of an idea, but the New Testament reveals, and the Old Testament has three persons. We get glimpses of it by using plural pronouns and things like that. But the idea is they didn't have a, a concept of, of God and three persons back in the uh, Old Testament. Their issue was getting one God right. <laughs> they, couldn't get, they couldn't get that right. Um... And could easily lead to false teachings about the nature of God. Now, if you got to understand the three persons and the progressive revelation, the triune nature of God came to fruition in the New Testament with the incarnation of the Son. And that's where the arguments came over. Who is the Son? Who is Jesus Christ? And what is his relationship to the Father? And was, was it co-equal and co-eternal? What was the relationship before it became the Son? That's why the issue uh, came up. Who is Jesus Christ? That, he, that he's actually God in the flesh. Uh, one of the weaknesses of the doctrine of incarnational sonship is that the basic relationship, relationship existing among the members of the Trinity are confused and diminished. No, they're not. They're just not revealed. It's not confused and diminished. What these guys want you to tell you, tell you with the eternal sonship is that this, this relationship always existed, but it can't always exist if you believe in a co-equal, co-eternal God. They just want to ignore the, the fact that Begotten means it's the, 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 the son would have to have alternately become from the father, which means the father, the fact that he always existed and the son didn't, would be superior to the son. They just want to ignore that. You're supposed to just ignore that while they'll say, well, we believe in Trinity, a co-equal, co-eternal. But then they'll say, well, it's an eternal generation and the son always existed as the son. Well, not if he's begotten by the father. And they won't be. They won't make an issue. Well, the son, if the father-son relationship didn't exist, and that 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 love relationship didn't exist, well, a love relationship did exist among the three persons. They just throw out the Holy Spirit, like somehow the Holy Spirit is, is not going to be loved as much as the other two persons of the Trinity. God cannot love another person in the Trinity less than he love more or less than the other two persons of the Trinity. The, the father-son relationship is an example to us. But the fact of the matter is, all three persons love each other equally. That can't change. You can't, you can't, you can't have, well, okay, well now, I have, I have a son, I have a father-son relationship, I don't love the Holy Spirit as much as I love my son. That can't happen. <laughs> can't happen. They love each other equally. Equally as, uh, as, as God. In that trying relationship. Uh, let's see here. Taken to his logical conclusion, Denying the eternal sonship of Christ reduces the Trinity from the relationship to of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to simply number one, number two, number three persons. Why are we supposed to know the identity of the three persons until they reveal themselves? As we, as we just all you have to know is the, the three persons who we know we know now as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. That's all. 
So the idea, they want to ignore the fact, when they get the eternal sonship, they want to ignore the fact that there's, you're creating one, the, the Father always existed eternally, and then he, he produces the Son. And the issue of the sonship is that it's voluntary. The Son voluntarily said he would be the Son. And willingly did not think it would be equal with God. He set aside his own glory. If it's begotten by the Father, it's not, then it's not voluntary. He was begotten to be the Son then. And there's nothing no voluntary about it. There had to be something voluntary about this. The, 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 the second person of the Trinity, who we know, we know, we call him the second person of the Trinity based on, on this relationship, voluntarily saying, I'll be the Son. I'll go. And make the sacrifice, become flesh, and make the sacrifice. If, if it's a begotten son, doesn't voluntarily about it. Uh, with the numbers themselves being arbitrary designation, destroying the God-given order and relationship that exists among the persons of the Trinity. Well, that relationship, that, that God-given order and relationship that exists among the persons of the Trinity is what they reveal to us. All we have to know is that there are three persons that have always existed as one God. And they show them, they, they reveal themselves to us as the Father, the Word, First John 5, First John 5, 7, the Word and the Holy Ghost. They reveal themselves. The, the Son is never called, in the beginning, called the Son. It calls it the Word. Why? Because the Word reveals the other two persons of the Trinity. To express, he, he's the one, he, he's the one that reveals, tells, tells us about who the, uh, the other persons are. So that's the argument about that. I want to uh, put a uh, little answer back there. So actually, the eternal sonship issue is philosophical double talk. No one can go back into eternity, people. One thing you can't understand is eternity. Man was not made to understand eternity. We were creating time. Everything we talk about eternity is speculation. It's all arbitrary speculation. Because you're talking about something inside, say, say, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and, and, and forever. Well, yesterday is a period of time. That's not eternity. Today I've forgotten thee. It's a period of time. They want to think that's eternity. No, eternity is no time. That's what eternity means. There's no time. Time ceases before God began time with creation. Time began with creation. We're talking about pre-creation. Before God created anything, there was no time. That's why the existence of God is a mystery that we can't grasp. That God is the I Am, that He always existed. We can't understand that. We, always, we see things that always have a beginning, at least, and then, you know, at an end. But we can, we can understand things not having an end. We, we're told, well, we're never going to have an end. And uh, uh, we go on into eternity. We live forever. But the idea of things have, not having a beginning... And that's where the evolutionists come into the idea, you know, that they have to have faith because they always have to start with something. We say, well, there's nothing. They have to start with the Big Bang and so on. Well, no, there's nothing. <laughs> you can't get something from nothing. And they come back at us and say, well, where do you get God from? We'll say, yeah, we, well, we're great. We can't prove there's not, there was a God before anything existed. We just, we believe there was. We start with the idea there has to be a God because we see the results of it. Results of a God with a creation, with a uh, order, you know, happens, uh, uh, everything has a beginning. Uh, there's an order in the universe. There's uh, there's morality in the universe. But we can't we can't prove the existence of God by the fact that you can't prove that uh, uh, God always existed. But neither can they prove evolution because they have to start with nothing. Nothing. We start with a person, three persons, one God. We start we start with we start with God. And then we say, from God, but it's faith. You start. You have to start, when you deal with eternity, you're starting in faith, because there's no time. There's nothing. There's no, there's nothing, there's no space, there's no time, it's just God. And these guys want you to think, no, uh, uh, we believe in a co-equal, co-eternal God, but uh, the Father, the, the Father, he's really the first one. Well, if he's the first one, then the other ones are inferior. They're subordinate. They won't co eternal because if one comes after the other one, and it's well, it's 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 illogical. What still it still makes him 
dependent. The son would be dependent on the father for his existence. Do you get that? He can't be dependent. None of the, none of the persons can be dependent on the other ones for their his, for his, for his, for his existence. That's why he's God. They are life. All three persons are life. They all have life. They are, they are life. They can't be dependent on another one of the persons in the Trinity for their own existence. And that's what the eternal sonship would do. Now, how do the eternal sonship people get around that? They just deny everything. Well, begotten doesn't mean begotten, it means unique. And uh, father doesn't mean, mean father in the sense of the way we look at father. And son doesn't mean, mean son the way we see son. And Holy Ghost doesn't mean what? They just deny everything. And then tell you to believe it. So the fact is, if we don't, because we don't know, we don't have names for the three persons before the plan was formulated and they, and they became Father, Son, or Father, Word, and Holy Ghost, and, and in the incarnation, he became the Son. And we don't have, we don't have names for them. That doesn't mean they exist as three persons. We just don't know the names. The plan revealed that. The plan, see what, what the Calvinists want to do is they make the plan eternal. See, they, there's, there's, no, there's no before the plan. The plan has always existed. There's an eternal covenant. They have that. And that's where you get into philosophical speculation when you're trying to deal with eternity. All you can do is you can go first, so far back and say, we know there had to be three persons. They're co-equal, co-eternal. And therefore, neither one begot the other one. They're not dependent. The, the son is not dependent on his existence in eternity. The second person in Trinity would not be dependent on the existence of the father. If he's dependent on him being begotten by the father, that makes him inferior to the father. And likewise with the Holy Ghost. So... Let me stop here and put this up and uh, put the, look at the other videos. I'll link it to the other videos. They do a very good job on it. I know this is, uh, you get people probably little rolling their eyes and saying, well, what are you people talking about? <laughs> Thank you. And that's understandable. We don't make, the incarnational sonship people don't make this a salvation issue. It's the eternal sonship guys do. They're fanatical about it. You see, you see the, uh, the venom popping out of these guys' mouths and, uh, because they associate, they oh, you're really saying this, you're saying that, you're saying, you're going to say the sonship is going to end. No, the sonship's never going to end. The subordination will end. But the fact Jesus Christ in the resurrection body is the Son of God, that will never end. But they rule as one. In eternity, they're going to rule as one God. The subordination aspects end. But the issue of being ending in time is different because there's a voluntary subordination. If it's an eternity, it's not voluntary. He was begotten to be the son, which meant he was begotten to be subordinate. And so where's the melt in that? But if you have three persons who pre-existed the plan, and they each agreed to their role in the plan, and this, the second person agreed to be the son, that's, that's a melt to that. He said, I'm going to be the son. And the father, there's a melt because he now had to send... The word, the word became flesh, and now, since the begotten son is only begotten son, and we see the aspect of what that love relationship that existed, and of course, the humanity now, the, the, the word became takes flesh. There's two natures involved now. Jesus Christ is two natures, not one nature, and so there's one person involved there. But you can't think of Jesus Christ apart from his humanity, also. That's part of his nature. That's uh, and b both natures are essential there through the person he is, and that's who he is in that resurrected body. So let me stop and put this up. Amen. Thank you.